Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya <clears throat> So we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 5, Chapter 10 we're on text 24. <clears throat> and this is translated with commentary by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So, Maharaj Rahugana is being enlightened about the his transcendental nature and how to make advancement in spiritual life by Judd Bharat, a great uh, pure devotee of the Lord. There was a little misunderstanding at first. Um, Maharaj Rahugina found fault with Jad Bharat. And um, now he's realizing his mistake at finding fault with a devotee of the Lord. The devotee of the Lord has no fault um, because they're not material. They're completely spiritualized. The Lord himself resides in that person, fully manifest personality of Godhead. Whereas he's in the hearts of all living beings, the Lord as Paramatma. <laughs> but because of a lack of devotion to the Lord, he's not fully manifest there. He's only partially manifest as Paramatma. And um, and in that form as Paramatma, he's sanctioning and allowing the activities of the conditioned soul according to their desire, what they want. Uh, man proposes, God disposes. He's allowing because that's what the um, birth of the material energy, material creation affords, is an opportunity for living beings to act out these different desires as if there was no God, as if they weren't, they weren't a servant of the Lord, as if they were the, the Lord. So, <clears throat> so Paramatma is there. He's allowing these different activities, giving the intelligence how to carry them out. That's where a bank robber gets his intelligence. It's from Paramatma. I want to rob that bank. So Krishna gives intelligence. Okay, rob the bank. But he's also in so many different ways, giving good counsel. You know, if you rob that bank, then there's big punishment. And then his representatives and the different spiritual teachers that have come to this place, this material world, are leaving their instructions of how, how to get out of identifying with the material body. But for those who don't want to, the soul, the Paramatma is there, and he's sanctioning their activities. He's fulfilling the desires of everyone since time immemorial. So the idea is, when the living entity is frustrated enough with their endeavors to enjoy in the material world, 
when they have the opportunity to hear about something else, like uh, transcendence, spiritual life, the personality of Godhead, and that they have a relationship with the Lord eternally, not this body. When they hear that, send then the opportunity to come out of that illusion or entanglement is there. But for those who desire to remain in illusion and try to find some happiness there, although there is none, the Lord's making the arrangements. Okay. okay. You can't force it because it's love that is w what loving devotional service is is what attracts the Lord and what uh, the Lord and the living entity that's the relationship is loving service So that's not something that can be forced. That's something that both parties, the Lord and the living entity, want to enter into that agreement. The Lord's waiting. It's, he's sitting there as Paramatma. He's like, example that's given in the scriptures is two birds in a tree. They're of the same nature, these birds, spiritual nature. They're sitting in this tree. The tree is like the body which includes the mind, subtle body. And one bird is frantically trying to enjoy the fruits of the tree. And the other bird's just sitting there, not at all attracted to the, the fruits of the material energies, not all. He's just waiting for the other bird to turn to him. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Maharaj Rahugana is now getting a little help from a pure devotee of the Lord who is in full relationship with the Lord. The Lord is fully manifest within the heart of Jad Bharat. And Jad Bharat is like that bird who is no longer interested in the fruits of that tree and has turned to the other bird, to Krishna. and has uh, no more attraction for those fruits. One of the fruits, happiness and distress, winning and losing, good and bad, up and down, have and have not, and all illusory, temporary, fleeting experiences. that can go on indefinitely. I mean, that can go on ad infinitum. And there's really no way out of that uh, ongoing situation until the soul turns to Krishna. So this is Maharaj Rahugan is now at that point. He's, he's wanting to he knows he's attached, like that bird who's trying to enjoy all those fruits. And he knows there's, there's God, he knows there's Krishna, but he needs a little help in getting directed toward turning toward that Lord within his heart. And that's the spiritual master. He's the external manifestation of the Lord within the heart. So, this is um, text 24, and this is Maharaj Rahugan is trying to understand some of the instructions that Chad Bharat has just given him, but he's, um, he's developing a relationship with Chad Bharat. It's not like impersonal knowledge. It's not like 
how to wire an electrical circuit. It's not that kind of knowledge. Or how to change a flat tire. <laughs> it's not that kind of knowledge. It's realized knowledge, and it comes through relationship. So he's now developing a relationship with Jad Bharat, which is non-different from developing a relationship with Krishna. It's different and it's not different. But he's developing this relationship with Jad Bharat. He's taking a submissive position. He's accepting him as his superior. And he's questioning him, not from the head, but from the heart. It's, this isn't, this kind of knowledge isn't just gyan, it's devotional knowledge. Realized knowledge from the heart. So for that there has to be relationship. So he's attracted to Jad Bharat. That's the first step. And undoubtedly, he probably wants what Jad Bharat has. He sees Jad Bharat is peaceful. He's unattached to material identity. He's, he's happy with nothing, really. And here the king has everything. And he's just in the mode of passion most of the time. So he probably wants what Jad Bharat has. He sees something there. So he's attracted to Jad Bharat. But he's not understanding. He doesn't have realization of what Jad Bharat is, has been telling him. It, he agrees with it. He finds no fault in it, but he, he's not realizing it. So he's asking more, for more realization. And that comes from relationship. So. This is uh, text 24. It says, Whatever you've spoken appears to me to be contradictory. O oh, best friend of the distressed, I've committed a great offense by insulting you. I was puffed up with false prestige due to possessing the body of a king. For this I've certainly become an offender. And therefore, I pray that you kindly glance at me with your causeless mercy. If you do so, I can be relieved from sinful activities brought about by insulting you. You can see how this relationship is developing. Prabhupada's commentary, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said that by offending a Vaishnav, one finishes all his spiritual activities. Offending a Vaishnava is considered mad, mad elephant offense. A mad elephant can destroy an entire garden which has been developed with great labor. One may attain the topmost platform of devotional service, but somehow or other if he offends a Vaishnav, the whole structure collapses. Unconsciously, King Rahugana offended Jad Bharat, but due to his good sense, he asked to be excused. This is the process by which one can be relieved from a Vaishnava Aparad. Krishna is always very simple and by nature merciful. When one commits an offense at the feet of a Vaishnava, one must immediately apologize to such a personality so that his spiritual advancement might not be hampered. Yeah, the Vaishnav, one offends a Vaishnav, the Vaishnav's not affected necessarily. I mean, they're fixed in their relationship with Krishna. But the person who railed against them or committed an offense against them, they destroy their own spiritual assets and their own relationship with Krishna. Here it says it's finished. No matter how much they've built up in their devotional life. And they commit that offense. 
to a servant of the Lord like that? Back down to zero. So it's a very serious offense in spiritual life to be envious or um, belittle or see a, a, a Vaishnav materially. Mm. The way to become free from it is to apologize to the Vaishnav and ask their mercy. So here uh, Maharaj Rahugan is asking that um, Please give the glance. Is that, is that what he says? Yes. Therefore, I pray you may kindly glance at me with your causeless mercy. Mm. Yeah. Causeless mercy. Yeah. So that's love. It's, I insulted you. I'm so sorry. Can you still love me anyway? Please, don't reject me. I'll correct, I'm trying to correct my ways. I see my mistake. I feel terrible about it. I accept you. Now you please accept me. In love. Devotion. Devotion. So we can see this relationship is developing. There's a dynamic of, of devotion developing here, devotional attitude, devotional mood, which when that devotion develops, then the hearing is enhanced can hear better. So Maharaj Bahugan is being prepared for really receiving the messages of Godhead. Text 25. My dear Lord, you're the friend of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who's the friend of all living entities. You're therefore equal to everyone, and you're free from the bodily conception. Although I've committed an offense by insulting you, I know there is no loss or gain for you due to my insult. You're fixed in your determination, but I committed an offense. Because of this, even though I may be as strong as Lord Shiva, I'll be vanquished without delay due to my offense at the lotus feet of a Vaishnav. And we were just discussing that. that Jud Bharat is fixed in his determination. He Praise him or blame him. Water on a duck's back. <laughs> but for the person who's offending, the other one that's in trouble, it's like they cut their nose off to spite their face kind of thing. You know? <laughs> Out on a limb of a tree and sawing the limb off. You know, it's, it's like suicide, spiritual suicide to do that. So he, he's recognized his mistake, and he also sees how it works. So he's fairly advanced. Um, this Maharaj Rahugan is fairly advanced. But these are some of the difficulties for someone who's engaged in administration and management. It's a very difficult service. It's a difficult service. It's very easy to become bewildered by a sense of power and being as good as God kind of thing. It's very, very difficult service telling people what to do, <laughs> dealing with uh, money and, and uh, property and possessions. And it's a very difficult service management, very difficult. And those devotees that are being directed to do that They have to be given a lot of respect, a lot of respect. 
and a lot of room to do their service too. You give them a lot of room to move around in. It's very necessary service, like in, in a in, for society. Very necessary. There must there has to be management in any society. But it's also their duty and their responsibility to hear from the devotees who are um, fixed in consciousness. Not everyone is going to be involved in management because that's the way Varnashram works. It's going to be, or has to be, a Brahminical class also that they're not involved in management. They're hearing and chanting and studying scripture and living very simply, whatever means they have for income. They're not career-minded. They're not ambitious in any way except to hear and chant more and more. <laughs> and they have other duties within Varnashram that Brahmins perform they're in charge of uh, ritualistic activities and ceremonies. and These things are all part of um, Brahminical culture. But they're not involved in management. So those that are involved in management, they will hear and take guidance from those devotees who are free from management. Because there's more to spiritual life than just management. Well, in that way, the whole thing gets guided back to Godhead. Everyone plays a different role like that. So Maharaj Rahugana is doing the perfect thing. He's a good king. Obviously, things are running very smoothly under him, and he has great respect for Vedic knowledge. And now he's hearing, by his good fortune, he more or less stumbled upon his good fortune in the form of a pure devotee of the Lord, Jad Bharat, who is now going to be instructing him further in the goal of life. So Prabhupada's commentary, Maharaj Rahugana was very intelligent and conscious of the inauspicious effects arising from insulting a Vaishnav. He was therefore very anxious to be excused by Jad Bharat Following in the footsteps of Maharaj Rahugana, everyone should be very cautious not to commit an offense at the lotus feet of a Vaishnav. Srila Vrindavan Das Thakur in his Chaitanya Bhagavat says, Even if one is as strong as Lord Shiva, who carries a trident in his hand, one will nevertheless fall down from his spiritual position if he tries to insult Vaishnav. That's the verdict of all Vedic scriptures. He also says in Chaitanya Bhagavat, one who blasphemes a Vaishnav cannot be protected by anyone. Even if a person is as strong as Lord Shiva, if he blasphemes a Vaishnav, he's sure to be destroyed. This is the verdict of all Shastras. If one does not care for the verdict of the Shastras and dares blaspheme a Vaishnav, he suffers life after life because of this. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the fifth canto, tenth chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam entitled Discussion Between Jad Bharat and Maharaj Rahugana. Just a little note on that um, blaspheming of Vaishnav. So Lord Shiva is actually the greatest Vaishnav. And we have the account of what happened between Lord Shiva and Daksha. Daksha was very opulent. He was one of the Prajapadis. And uh, he was very opulent, and he, he had a lot of um, pious credits, he, performing sacrifices and doing very valuable service for the um, Supreme Personality of Godhead. But he... Uh, offended Lord Shiva. He saw him externally. Um, his daughter was married to Lord Shiva and 
evidently um, having Lord Shiva as a son-in-law was maybe a kind of embarrassment to him because he was seeing Lord Shiva externally that he covered with ashes and his associates are from the mode of ignorance for the most part because that's his service. It's like Daksha was a Prajapati. Well, Lord Shiva has a service too. He's in charge of the mode of ignorance. So, but he's, he himself is a great Vaishnava. He's one of the greatest devotees, Lord Shiva. He's not an ordinary uh, living entity either. He's a little bit more than a, than a jiva. He's, he's very special. He's his own category of uh, living entity, Lord Shiva. And, but Daksha being the father-in-law, evidently he didn't like his daughter being married to Lord Shiva. So it was time to do a, um, and also I think there was some misunderstanding. Daksha appeared in the assembly and Lord Shiva was in meditation on Krishna and he didn't like stand up immediately or something, something like that. There was something and so, so Daksha just, I can't deal with this, Lord Shiva. I can't deal with it. I, I, I'm going to do another sacrifice, and I just, I don't want him here. I just, I don't want him here. So he offended Lord Shiva. And he, his daughter was brokenhearted because she was excluded from the event, which is, yeah, it's a, um, a, a spiritual event, but it's also a social event. And... She wanted to be with the family members and she and her husband to come. And I, so it was uh, very offensive. And for that, you know, there was a big problem. Daksha suffered uh, quite a bit from that. It was a, he ended up with <clears throat> his head cut off. And, <clears throat> and uh, it was replaced with a head of a goat. And he... He begged pardon from Lord Shiva. He saw his mistake. So there's a lot of examples like that of the severity of seeing a, a Vaishnava materially and um, offending them. So this is chapter 11, and there's a little summary here. So we'll know what the chapter is about. In this chapter, the Brahmin, Jag Bharat, instructs Maharaj Rahugana in detail. He tells the king, You're not very experienced, yet you pose yourself as a learned person because you're very proud of your knowledge. Actually, a person who is on the transcendental platform does not care for social behavior that sacrifices spiritual advancement. Social behavior comes within the jurisdiction of karmakanda, material benefit. No one can spiritually advance by such activities. The conditioned soul is always overpowered by the modes of material nature. No one can spiritually advance by such activities. The conditioned soul is always uh, conditioned soul is always overpowered by the modes of material nature. And consequently, he is simply concerned with material benefits and auspicious and inauspicious material things. In other words, the mind which is the leader of the senses is absorbed in material activities life after life. Thus, he continually gets different types of bodies suffers miserable material conditions. On the basis of mental concoction, social behavior has been formulated. If one's mind is absorbed in these activities, he certainly remains conditioned within the material world. According to different opinions, there are 11 or 12 mental activities which can be transformed into hundreds and thousands. A person who is not Krishna conscious is subjected to all these mental concoctions and is thus governed by material energy. 
The living entity who is free from mental concoctions attains the platform of pure spirit soul, devoid of material contamination. There are two types of living entities, Jivatma and Paramatma, the individual soul and the supreme soul. The supreme soul, in his ultimate realization, is Lord Vasudev, Krishna. He enters into everyone's heart, controls the living entity in his different activities. He is, therefore, the supreme shelter of all living entities. One can understand the supreme soul and one's position in relationship with him when one is completely freed from the unwanted association of ordinary men. In this way, one can become fit to cross the ocean of nations. The cause of conditional life is attachment to the external energy. One has to conquer these mental concoctions. Unless one does so, he will never be freed from material anxieties. Although mental concoctions have no value, their influence is still very formidable. No one should neglect to control the mind. If one does, the mind becomes so powerful that one immediately forgets his real position, forgetting that he is an eternal servant of Krishna and that service to Krishna is his only business. One's doomed by material nature to serve the objects of the senses. One should kill mental concoctions by the sword of service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his devotee, Guru Krishna Prashadi Bhai Bhakti Lata Bij. Text 1. The Brahmin Jad Bharat said, My dear king, although you're not at all experienced, you're trying to speak like a very experienced man. Consequently, you cannot be considered an experienced person. An experienced person does not speak the way you're speaking about the relationship between a master and a servant or about material pains and pleasures. These are simply external activities. Any advanced experienced man considers the absolute truth, does not talk in this way. Hmm. Prabhupada's commentary. Krishna similarly chastised Arjuna. Asochanan Vasochastam Pragnavadam Chabasase. While speaking learned words, you're lamenting for what's not worthy of grief. Similarly, among people in general, 99.9% .9 try to talk like experienced advisors, but they're actually devoid of spiritual knowledge and are therefore like inexperienced children speaking, speaking nonsensically. Consequently, their words cannot be given any importance. One has to learn from Krishna or his devotee. If one speaks on the basis of this experience, that is, on the basis of spiritual knowledge, one's words are valuable. At the present moment, the entire world is full of foolish people. Bhagavad Gita describes these people as mudas. They're trying to rule human society. Because they're devoid of spiritual knowledge, the entire world is in a chaotic condition. To be released from these miserable conditions, one has to become Krishna conscious, take lessons from an exalted personality like Jadbarat, Lord Krishna, Kapiladev. That's the only way to solve the problems of material life. Hmm. Hmm. So any um, arrangements that are made without considering the personality of Godhead are doomed. They're doomed to failure if there's no consideration for the service of the Lord. It's simply illusory plans, illusory arrangements without the um, connection with the source of the creation. So they have no permanence and they'll have no good effect either. 
So Prabhupada says 99.9% .9 talk like experienced advisors. But really, they're just like inexperienced children speaking nonsensically. Like uh, children in a sandbox arguing over which way to move the toy dump truck. <laughs> this is nonsensical for solving any of the problems of life. It's like childish play. So their decisions and their advice is uh, it's useless. It won't solve any problems. Text two. So Jed Barad is pointing out that the way you're seeing things in your discussion about master and servant and how to manage, because he's a manager, it is like that. Without considering the personality of Godhead, and, and these things are, they're not even worthy of consideration. It's just useless talk, nonsensical. Okay, so text two. My dear king talks of the relationship between the master and the servant, the king and the subject, and so forth, I simply talk about material activities. People interested in material activities, which are expounded in the Vedas, are intent on performing material sacrifices and placing faith in their material activities. For such people, spiritual advancement is definitely not manifest. Prabhupada's commentary. In this verse, two words are significant, Vedavata and Tattvavata. According to Bhagavad Gita, those who are simply attached to the Vedas do not understand the purpose of the Vedas or Vedanta Sutra called Vedavata Rata. Men of small knowledge are very much attached to the flowery words of the Vedas, which recommend various fruit of activities for elevation to heavenly planets result in good birth, power, and so forth. Being desirous of sense gratification and opulent life, they say there's nothing more than this. So it's even possible to, from the Vedas, and they don't understand the purpose behind the Vedas, in performing sacrifices and religious functions, but not for approaching the personality of Godhead, simply stuck in um, desire for material sense gratification. Only Krishna or his pure devotee can give the real meaning behind the Vedas, because they are the meaning behind the Vedas, personified. That's why. Mm -hmm. The Vedavata followers of the Vedas are generally inclined to karmakanda. The performance of sacrifice according to Vedic injunctions. They are thereby promoted to higher planetary systems. They generally practice chaturmasya, akshayam hahi vai chaturmasya yagna sukritam bhavati. One who performs chaturmasya yagna becomes pious. By becoming pious, one may be promoted to the higher planetary systems. Urdvam gachanti sattva stam. Some of the followers of the Vedas are attached to karmakanda, fruit of activities of the Vedas, in order to be promoted to a higher standard of life. Others argue that this is not the purpose of the Vedas. In this world, someone may become very highly elevated by taking birth in an aristocratic family, by being well-educated, beautiful, or very rich. These are the gifts for pious activities enacted in the past life. However, these will be finished when the stocks of pious activity is finished. 
If we become attached to pious activities, we may get these various worldly facilities in the next life and may take birth in heavenly planets, but all of this will eventually be finished. Shine punye marchilo kambishanti. When the stock of pious activity is finished, one again has to come to this marchiloka, place of death. According to the Vedic injunctions, the performance of pious activity is not really the objective of the Vedas. The objective of the Vedas is explained in Bhagavad Gita. The objective of the Vedas is to understand Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Those who are Vedavadis are not actually advanced in knowledge, and those who are followers of Jnanakanda, Brahman understanding, are not also perfect. However, when one comes to the platform of Upasana and accepts worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he becomes perfect. In the Vedas, the worship of different demigods and the performance of sacrifice are certainly mentioned. But such worship is inferior because the worshippers do not know the ultimate goal is Vishnu. When one comes to the platform of Vishnu Radhanam or Bhakti Yoga, one has attained the perfection of life. Otherwise, as indicated in Bhagavad Gita, one is not a tattvavadi, but a vedavadi, a blind follower of Vedic conjunctions. A vedavadi cannot be purified from material contamination unless he becomes a tattvavadi, that is, one who knows tattva, the absolute truth. Tattva is also experienced in three features, brahmeti, paramatmeti, bhagavaniti, sabjate. Even after coming to the platform of understanding tattva, one must worship Bhagavan, Vishnu, and his expansions, or one is not yet perfect. Bahunam Janmanamante Gyanavamam Prapajate. After many births, one who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto Krishna. The conclusion is that unintelligent men with a poor fund of knowledge cannot understand Bhagavan, Brahman, or Paramatma. But after studying the Vedas and attaining the understanding of the Absolute Truth, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one is supposed to be on the platform of perfect knowledge. Hmm. That's why study of the Vedas is done under the guidance of a devotee. Then the real meaning of the Vedas can come out. Because Krishna is understood through devotion. And where does devotion come from? It comes from the devotee. So by studying the Vedas under the guidance of a devotee with the devotional spirit, then the real meaning of the Vedas can come out. And who has that devotional spirit? The devotee. Text three. Oh, and that's why somebody makes offense to such a devotee, all their spiritual life is ruined. That's why. That's why it's such a horrible offense. That even if, say, somebody offends a devotee like that, who is the embodiment of that devotional spirit that unlocks the um, access to the real meaning of the Vedas, the deep meaning. As Krishna says, by undivided devotional service, I can be understood as I am standing before you. So approaching the Vedas, Krishna is standing there in the Vedas. But to, to be able to um, realize that, that needs devotional service. 
and by Krishna's own arrangement, the, devotion, the devotee is the embodiment of Krishna and devotional service. So to offend the guide, the teacher, the abode of the Lord, how would one ever have any access to the actual meaning of the Vedas? They won't. So all their spiritual, they're right back down on the material platform again. They just committed spiritual suicide. So Maharaja Hugana is getting the mercy. He can, uh, Jad Bharat continues speaking, text 3. A dream becomes automatically known to a person as false and immaterial. And similarly, one eventually realizes that material happiness in this life or the next on this planet or a higher planet is insignificant. When one realizes this, the Vedas, although an excellent source, are insufficient to bring about direct knowledge of truth. This is getting interesting. <laughs> See where this goes. Isn't that interesting? Read that verse again. I see what Prabhupada's commentary is. I'm going to read that verse again. A dream becomes automatically known to a person as false and immaterial. And similarly, one eventually realizes material happening in this life or the next, or on a planet or a higher planet, is insignificant. So that would be like liberation. Because they're no longer endeavoring for um, material satisfaction. They're able to distinguish the self as different from material covering. So when one realizes this, one's liberated, the Vedas, although an excellent source, are insufficient to bring about direct knowledge of the truth. Hmm. I'm tempted to say that for that, that's where hearing from the realized soul comes in, the person, the devotee who carries that devotional, uh, is the embodiment of devotional service to the Lord, that's what brings about the direct knowledge of the truth. But let's see what Prabhupada's commentary is. <clears throat> In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna advised Arjuna to become transcendental to material activities impelled by the three material modes of nature, Trigunya Visaya Veda and Istrigunya Bhavarjuna. The purpose of Vedic study is to transcend the activities of the three modes of material nature. Of course, in the material world, the mode of goodness is accepted as the best, and one can be promoted to higher planetary systems by being on the Sattvagun platform. However, that is not perfection, one must come to the conclusion that even Sattvagun is not also good. One may dream he has become a king with a good family, wife, children, but immediately, at the end of the dream, he comes to the conclusion it was false. Similarly, all kinds of material happiness are undesirable for a person who wants spiritual salvation. If a person does not come to the conclusion that he has nothing to do with any kind of material happiness. He cannot come to the platform of understanding the absolute truth or tattva gyan. Karma gyanis, karmis, gyanis, and yogis are after some material elevation. Karmis work hard day and night for bodily comfort. Gyanis simply speculate about how to get out of the entanglement of karma and merge into a Brahman effulgence. And yogis are very much addicted to the acquisition of material perfection and magical powers. All of them are trying to be materially perfect, but a devotee very easily comes to the platform of Nirguna in devotional service. And consequently, for the devotee, the results of karma, jnana, and yoga become very insignificant. Therefore, only the devotee is on the platform of tattva jnana, not the others. Of course, the jnani's position is better than that of the karmi, but that position is also insufficient. The jnani must 
actually be li become liberated. And after liberation, he may be situated in devotional service. Mud Bhaktim Labate Param. Okay, so the Vedas elevate one how to transcend the three modes of material nature. And sometimes someone can get stuck in the mode of goodness because it's the best of modes and there's happiness and peacefulness and different kinds of uh, opulences come in the mode of goodness, but they're temporary because it's a material mode. So ultimately, even the mode of goodness has to be um, transcended. This material happiness has to be transcended. Anything material, happy or sad or happy, is still material. So it has to be, it has to be transcended. It's only the devotee is on the platform of real knowledge. Text 4. As long as the mind of the living entity is contaminated by the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, his mind is exactly like an independent, uncontrolled elephant. It simply expands its jurisdiction of pious and impious activities by using the senses. The result is that the living entity remains in the material world to enjoy and suffer pleasures and pains due to material activity. As long as the mind is contaminated by the three modes, goodness, passion, and ignorance. How important it is to get the mind purified. And this chanting, introducing this chanting of Hare Krishna, is man means mind and tra means to control. So controlling the mind by chanting the holy name of the Lord. And it is not a material activity. It is a devotional activity to chant Hare Krishna it is devotional service. Service to the Lord in his incarnation as his holy name. So this controls the mind from because coming in contact with devotional service is pure and transcendental so goodness, passion, and ignorance, they have no jurisdiction there where the Lord is incarnated. There is no goodness, passion, or ignorance. It's a different type of energy. It's not material energy. So this is the great mercy of Lord Chaitanya's mission to help free the living entities, get them beyond the material modes of nature simply by engaging in devotional service, chanting his holy names. So Prabhupada's commentary. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is said, <clears throat> material pious and impious activities are both opposed to the principle of devotional service. Devotional service means mukti, freedom from material entanglement, but pious and impious activities result in entanglement within this material world. If the mind is captivated by the pious and impious activities mentioned in the Vedas, one remains eternally in darkness. One cannot attain the absolute platform. To change the consciousness from ignorance to passion, passion to goodness, does not really solve the problem. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, Sagunyan Samatitaitan Brahmabhuyaya Kopate, one must come to the transcendental platform, otherwise life's mission is never fulfilled. You know, that's interesting. I think making advancement in life by, by switching out of, from the mode of ignorance into the mode of passion and then ah, you're coming up in life into the mode of goodness, you really haven't solved anything. It's just the mode. It's material nature. It's like uh, being on a a Ferris wheel, you know, just keep going around and around in the modes of material nature. Uh, 
<laughs> so it really hasn't solved anything. The solution is to transcend. And the way to transcend is to make contact with the devotional energy of the Lord. Engage in devotional service. It's a different type of energy altogether of the Lord's. Just like uh, material world is nourished by the sunlight, the energy coming from the sun. So the spiritual atmosphere is nourished and sustained by bhakti, the devotional energy of the Lord. Something like that. <laughs> so we want to make contact with the devotional energy. It's the spiritual sunshine. So the little plant of devotion service can grow. Text 5. Because the mind is absorbed in desires for pious and impious activities, it is naturally subjected to transformations of lust and anger. In this way, it becomes attracted to material sense enjoyment. In other words, the mind is conducted by the modes of goodness, passion, and ignorance. There are 11 senses, 5 material elements, and out of these 16 items, the mind is the chief. Therefore, the mind brings about birth in different types of bodies among demigods, human beings, animals, and birds. When the mind is situated in a higher or lower position, it accepts a higher or lower material body. Yeah, that's another way of saying um, what was discussed in, a, in an earlier portion of the Bhagavatam, that the material desires are within the mind. And so the gross body, when it's finished, then the desires that are within the subtle body, the subtle body is not finished when the gross body is finished. The, subtle, the desires that are situated in the subtle body carry the soul to another gross birth, another bodily, external bodily form, gross bodily form, so they can act out those desires. So the mind is the chief, and the mind is dragging the living entity to different lifetimes because of the um, contaminations within the mind. Prabhupada's commentary. Transmigration among the 8,400,000 species is due to the minds being polluted by certain material qualities. Due to the mind, the soul is subjected to pious and impious activities. The continuation of material existence is like the waves of material nature. Yeah, that's, that's interesting there, that pious and impious activities. So any material activity, whether it's impious or pious, is still a material activity. So it's not like something's auspicious and something's inauspicious. That's material designation. Oh, this is good. Good for what? Good for material life. So how is that good? Material life isn't good. So, so these are contaminations, both impious and pious. It's just different sides of the same coin. The continuation of material existence is like the waves of material nature. In this regard, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, My dear brother, the spirit soul is completely under the control of maya, and you are being carried away by its waves. This is also confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. Prakriti krimana ni gunai karmani sarvasa ahankara vimudatma kartahami timanyate. The bewildered spirit soul under the influence of the three modes of material nature thinks himself the doer of activities which are in actuality carried out by nature. Material existence means being fully controlled by material nature. The mind is the center for accepting the dictations of material nature. In this way, the living entity is carried away 
different types of bodies continuously. Millennium after millennium. Due to the living entity's forgetfulness of Krishna, one is bound by the laws of material nature. So the mind is the chief. Here, Prabhupada says, the mind is the center for accepting the dictations of material nature. It's interesting. The mind is the center for accepting the dictations of material nature. Hmm. The mind's connected to the senses, and the senses are connected to their objects. So mind is like central control. <laughs> central control, the mind. Mm. So the mind is sitting there. What's on the radar? <laughs> ah, Krishna. I have to put Krishna on the radar. <laughs> mm. Due to the living entity's forgetfulness of Krishna, one is bound by the laws of material nature. So the other way to look at it is that due to remembrance of Krishna, one is freed from the laws of material nature. That's the other side of that one. I'll stop there. Hare Krishna. <laughs>